Okay, welcome everyone um, for the Simon's uh, Quantum Seminar. So today we're happy to have uh, Yuan Su. So Yuan is a graduate student from University of Maryland, and he's done, lo done lots of work in uh, the area of quantum simulation. And so today he's gonna tell us about uh, some of the latest, which is joint work with uh, his advisor, Andrew Childs, and then Min Tran, Nathan Reeb, and Xu Shen Zhu. Uh, so he, and um, he's gonna tell us about the theory of Trotter error. Um, so, uh, welcome, Yuan. Uh, okay, thanks very much for the very nice introduction. And um, today I would like to say something about uh, quantum simulation. And the title of this talk is uh, Theory of Trotter Error. And this is joint work, uh, which is done in collaboration with Andrew Childs, Ming Chuan, uh, Nathan Webb, and Shu Chen Zhu. Um, so, to begin with, um, let me talk about the dynamics of quantum systems. So as we all know, the dynamics of a quantum systems are determined by its uh, Hamiltonian, it's a Hermitian operator, according to the so-called Sharding equation. So it's basically a first order differential equation with some initial condition. Um, in general, if this Hamiltonian is a time dependent operator, then you won't get a um, closed form solution for this equation. So in this case, you just formally represent the solution as um, this is something called a time ordered evolution operator. So it's uh, just a formal representation. But in the special case where this Hamiltonian is a time independent operator, then um, here we have a very nice property. We have a nice closed form solution to this Sharding equation. It's given by this e to the minus ith. It's just a matrix explanation. So um, basically the problem of quantum simulation is as follows. So you have a Hamiltonian, uh, which is um, the time independent case. We have an operator here. Uh, we have an evolution time, let's say time t. And basically the problem is you just want to perform this e to the minus ith up to some error epsilon. Um, so this problem seems to be very straightforward. Uh, basically you just want to exponentiate a matrix um, it is actually quite difficult for a classical computer when the dimensionality is large. Uh, but on the other hand, the solution of this problem could potentially be applied to many errors. So for example, uh, people have been trying to um, explore the application of quantum simulation to studying chemical reactions or studying material science. And also, um, there are also applications of quantum simulation to designing other quantum algorithms. For example, if you have an adiabatic evolution, you try to implement that on a quantum computer using ideas of quantum simulation. And also in more recent years, um, there have been many algorithms proposed for solving other problems such as solving linear equations or some other problems. And in those algorithms, um, some of, uh, in many of, those, many of those algorithms, um, they use quantum simulation as a subroutine. And you know, in fact, it's, Quantum simulation is actually one of the original motivations for Feynman to propose this idea of a quantum computer. And um, nowadays people like to talk about near-term applications and quantum simulation is also one of the potential problems for near-term quantum computer to solve. Okay, so there are many algorithms that you can use to simulate Hamiltonians on a quantum computer. But perhaps the most uh, straightforward approach is uh, this approach based on product form errors. So I guess, depending on who you are talking with, um, you could get different names for the same method. So for example, um, there are some people uh, working in physics, usually calling it a trotterization. So they say they have an evolution, then they want to trotterize that evolution. Well, on the other hand, there are also people working on mathematics, uh, usually for example, numerical analysis would call it a splitting method or operator splitting method. Um, but you know, I don't belong to those two groups, so I'll just call it product formula. Uh, in any case, the assumption here is that um, we have a target system, which is given as a linear combination of terms. So um, basically you have a Hamiltonian, uh, which is given as a sum of several terms. And you assume that each term is a Hermitian operator and can be exponentiated with constant cost on a quantum computer. So um, under this assumption, what you can do is uh, you use this so-called first order Lee-Trotter formula. So instead of 
um, remember that your goal is to sorry. exponent. Sorry, can I interrupt with just a main question? What sure. do you mean by can be exponentiated with cost of one? So does oh, it mean so that the matrix has constant size or there's a more general? Yeah, so basically um, this Hamiltonian is decomposed into several terms and you assume that the, the operator e to the minus i theta h gamma can be decomposed into elementary quantum gates and the number of gates that used in your decomposition is constant. And it can be computed in constant time also, the decomposition. Um, the coefficients are, can be computed. Okay, so it just means that h gamma is local, no? Is, basically, is the, the gate complexity of implementing each e to the h gamma is constant. Okay. For example, it could be two local Pauli terms, like x, s, y, y, and z, z, something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, but in any case, the, remember the goal here is that you want to exponentiate the sum of these this operators, but um, what you can do is uh, you individually exponentiating each operator and then you put them together. So um, this is um, sometimes called a first order Detroiter formula because it's first order accurate. So the error will be second order in the time. Um, we, we call it a Trotter error. And um, uh, in your simulation, you have to control the error. And uh, to control this error, it turns out that you don't directly apply this formula to the entire evolution, but uh, rather what you want to do is uh, you first divide the evolution into R steps called the Trotter steps. And then within each step, you apply this ab above formula, and then you put them together, repeat R times. So in order to control the error, what you can do is uh, you choose this R to be very large, sufficiently large so that your total error be controlled below epsilon. So this will give you a product formula algorithm. You can analyze the gate complexity as the number of steps times the number of operators that you perform within each step. Okay, so this is a simplest formula that you can use. Um, there are also some more complicated formulas uh, that can help you achieve higher order accuracy. So for example, in general, you could have um, a piece order product formula. Uh, so I'm writing some expression like this. Um, so in general, you could have multiple stages in the product formula. And then within each stage, you could have different orderings of the Hamiltonian terms. And uh, this could help you achieve higher order accuracy. So this expression seems a little bit complicated, but I can give you a very simple example. So there's a um, well-known construction by Suzuki in 1992. So in his construction, he started with a second order formula. So if you look at this definition, you'll find that it's um, a symmetric version of the first order formula, right? So you have two st stages. In the first stage, you order the term in the forward direction. And in the second stage, you order the term in the backward direction. So um, this satisfies the above general form. And then uh, you can construct a more higher order formulas based on this uh, Suzuki S2K formula. Okay, so um, in any case, these are some very simple mathematical tools that you can use to uh, simulate Hamiltonians on a quantum computer. Um, I should mention that beyond this, uh, this approach, there have been many other approaches developed in recent years for quantum simulation. So, you know, here I have a picture which shows some of the other quantum simulation algorithms. Um, it's a picture discovered by my co-author Ming. <laughs> so if you look at this picture, um, you see that there's this uh, algorithm based on truncating Taylor series. Um, there's this uh, other algorithm called the cubitization. Um, there are also some other algorithms, for example, this algorithm based on quantum walk and many, many other quantum simulation algorithms. So, you know, product formula doesn't look very happy because this more recent quantum simulation algorithm have improved the asymptotic performance as a function of the evolution time and the accuracy over the, the basic product formula approach. So, um, I guess maybe some people want to say, let's just forget about product formulas because you know, we have this more advanced or fancier quantum simulation algorithms. Uh, but perhaps this is not the right thing to do because 
if you actually look at the empirical performance of this quantum simulation algorithms, actually in many cases, product formula can become the best one to use. So here I have a picture uh, where I compared the gate complexity of different quantum simulation algorithms for simulating a one-dimensional Heisenberg model. So it's a nearest neighbor interactive system. Um, and then um, I compared the, the gate complexity as a function of the, uh, of the system size. So you see from this picture that indeed, if you only care about the rigorous error analysis, then product formula doesn't perform really well. Well, it has the largest gate complexity among all the, all the quantum simulation algorithms. But on the other hand, if you throw in all the empirical data into this picture, there's a, a huge change. So now, really product formula has the least gate count among all the quantum simulation algorithms here. So there is a significant gap between what we can prove for the product formula and what their actual performance. So, you know, this is something that we need to try to further understand what is going on here. So beyond this reason, there have been many other reasons why we need to continue to study product formulas. Although it has been somehow de-emphasized in recent theoretical studies of quantum simulation. So product formula is a um, very simple algorithm. It doesn't use any ancillary qubits to do that decomposition, which is perhaps more suitable for near-term quantum simulation. But on the other hand, um, as we just saw in that picture, product formulas can sometimes be very efficient, um, especially in the case where uh, many terms of the Hamiltonian commute or nearly commute. So this is a, a unique feature that doesn't seem to hold for like more general, more recent quantum simulation algorithms. Well, there are some additional features. So for example, product formula is a direct translation of the terms of the Hamiltonian into its corresponding exponential. So sometimes this kind of translation can preserve certain properties of the system. For example, if your system is nearest neighbor interacted, something like this, you have red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, something like this. Then correspondingly, um, you can try to construct a quantum circuits according to product formulas. And you know, you, you have this, this picture it also has some locality property. And sometimes this can help you to further speed up your simulation. Um, other applications, for example, in classical simulation of quantum systems, quantum Monte Carlo simulation, and also in sometimes in areas beyond quantum computing. Um, so basically there are many aspects of product formulas that one can explore. Um, but in this work, we would like to focus on the second point listed here. Namely, we want to understand how product formulas can uh, exploit the commutativity of the Hamiltonian to speed up quantum simulation. Okay, so there are some previous work on trying to understanding this capability. And um, I guess I can tell you some of the previous attempts to, to understand this capability. So um, there is something called a baker campbell hausdorff expansion. So let's say, suppose we, are, we have a very special example where this Hamiltonian only contains two terms. Like we only have A and B, two term Hamiltonian. Then there is a, a representation of the Trotter error as something like this. So here you have the ideal evolution, it's e to the a plus b. But then you also have some error term. And this uh, baker campbell hausdorff expansion helps you represent the error as the exponent and represent it as an infinite series. OK, so um, I guess I'm a little bit sloppy here because I didn't tell you about the convergence of this series, but for now, let's just ignore this issue and assume that this um, BCH expansion always holds. Then basically you can just represent this error as a nested commutator, infinite series. Okay, so there are several things that we can do about this BCH expansion. So for example, one thing that we can do is uh, we can say, let's ignore all the higher order errors. Let's only look at the focus on the lowest order error. Uh, let's say this T square and commutator of B and A. And we try to understand um, the, the scaling of this term. Well, this approach is very intuitive because 
it tells you the commutation uh, information of the Hamiltonian uh, in the error analysis, but it's not very rigorous because it turns out that in many cases, those higher order error terms in this expansion actually dominate the error contribution. So if you only look at the lowest order error, sometimes you ignore the significant contribution from the higher order terms. So another thing that you can do is uh, you say, let's try to derive some tail bounds. So for example, whenever you encounter this commutator of B and A, you always upper bound the norm of this by two times the norm of B times the norm of A. So from there, you try to derive some tail bounds. Um, well, this approach is very simple to calculate. You can try to calculate the number out of that, but it doesn't explore all the commutativity of the Hamiltonian throw away that information. So it doesn't provide a very tight bound in general. Um, another thing that you can do is um, you say for some concrete systems, let's try to directly calculate this infinite series. Well, um, that approach turns out to be very advantageous for systems with some Lie algebra structures. But for other systems, uh, we won't get a very tight bound in general. Okay, so it turns out that none of these analysis will give you a very tight analysis in general. Um, so this is something that hasn't been answered in previous work. But if you only look at the low order product formula, let's say the first order formula, then actually you can get a very tight analysis. So let's say, suppose we want to look at a first order formula. Uh, again, we have a two term Hamiltonian, H equals to A plus B. And then we have this first order formula, which is e to the a, e to the b. And um, for this first order formula in this special case, you can get a very tight bound. So how do we do that? Well, you start with this differential equation. So you differentiate this first order formula and you try to write down this first order differential equation with some initial condition. Um, it turns out that the solution of this differential equation is given by something called a variation of parameters formula. So basically applying that formula, you can get an um, integral representation of the error of the first order formula. Okay, so um, inside this uh, integral, you have a lot of matrix exponentials. Um, they are not very important for us because when you calculate the spectral norm, uh, they will be evaluated to one because they are unitary operators. So the thing that um, we should focus on is uh, this thing in the middle, it's colored in orange. And uh, for this term, we can further get another integral representation by um, doing something like fundamental theorem of calculus to get another um, integral representation by differentiate this term. Okay, so let's now put them together. Uh, we have a double integral representation of the error of the first order formula. And um, as we just mentioned, there are a lot of exponentials here, but they're not very important because we can just evaluate the spectral norm to one. So the important thing is a commutator in the middle and uh, we just keep it in our error bounds. Okay, so this error bounds turn out to be pretty tight because if you compare this expression with the previous uh, BCH um, formula, you see that it exactly matches the lowest order term of the BCH expansion. But now um, the idea is that we can rigorously prove this for the first order formula. Okay, so um, this is a special case, a two term Hamiltonian. Well, you can try to generalize this to a general Hamiltonian um, by bootstrapping this kind of analysis. And you can try to derive a similar error bounds for the second order formula. But unfortunately, um, before this work, there have been no generalizations to arbitrary higher order formulas um, using commutators of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so instead we derive the following results in our work called the Trotter error with commutator scale. So let's say we have a product formula. Let's say we have a piece order product formula and we try to simulate this Hamiltonian given as a sum of operators. Um, then I claim that 
the error of this product formula will scale like this, depending on this quantity called the alpha computer. So what is alpha computer? Well, it's given as the sum of all the possible nested commutators of the Hamiltonian um, with p layers. So um, this is the argument about the error of the product from like the Trotter error, but you can directly translate that to an argument about the gate complex. I won't show you how you do the translation, but it turns out that the resulting gate complexity will also depend on this quantity called the alpha computer. So, you know, this is a quantity that we need to try to compute if we want to compute the um, complexity of product form. Well, obviously this expression is symmetric. So if you only care about the asymptotic scaling, then um, you don't have to worry about the ordering of the terms because all of them will give you the same alpha com tutor. But of course, if you care about the constant prefactor, then you have to choose your ordering carefully. Um, this is a bound for the additive error for the real-time evolution. And there are also some related bounds for multiplicative error and imaginary time evolution. And uh, um, I didn't show you in this presentation. Um, I guess in the following, I can probably present some of the applications of this main results to digital quantum simulation and quantum Monte Carlo simulation. But before that, um, maybe I can stop for a few minutes to see if there's any questions. One question is, um, so these are all big O's. So is there, can you argue about these bounds being optimal in some sense? So can you, um, construct, is that, are there lower bounds for um, this scaling? Yeah. I guess the power of T probably this is easy, but but then the, you know, the alpha. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, that's a very good question. So I guess um, currently we don't have a very, good lower bound arguments, but for very simple case, like this first order formula, you get an error bound like this. And it turns out that this will match the BCH low order term of the BCH expansion. So mm -hmm. it's pretty tight in this sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah. for general, uh, we don't have a good lower bound arguments for this. Uh, so I have a question, which is you said that uh, before for the high order commutator bound, it was not in the literature. I think maybe there are, but uh, in the standard applied math uh, numerical analysis literature, usually the commutator bound is not like uh, the end product. Uh, the end product is further to bound the commutator that applies to the solutions I see. Uh, to uh, uh, and by some high order derivative norms of the solution. So it's, it's not written in that way, but I think there are some works along that. I see. Thanks for the comments. Yeah. Oh, there's a, let me read one question. Um, oh, um, so you, um, everything here was time independent. So is there any way in which um, some of these things generalize to the time dependent case? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think, um, I think this analysis will be able to generalize to time dependent case, but uh, we didn't work out the details in the, in the paper, but I think it should be generalizable. Uh, here's another question uh, along the lines of a previous question, which uh, remarked that the bounds have been worked out for um, the end product. I imagine you'll also go ahead and show some of your explicit speed ups for some of the specialized Hamiltonians. But I was wondering if there's a greater pattern that you can see to them, like what are ingredients for Hamiltonians such that you will be able to do much better than these uh, bounds? And how in general can you um, foretell how well a Hamiltonian might do? I see, so I guess um, perhaps um, a general model that we considered as an applications of this result is um, so-called the K-local Hamiltonian. So 
your Hamiltonian is written as a sum of several terms and each term acts on a constant number of qubits. And I think this model is, um, is a very general model that includes many um, more specific concrete systems. And we are able to show there is a speed up using product formulas for simulating k-local Hamiltonians. And I don't know, I guess probably this could give some intuitions on um, the kind of ideas going on uh, behind the speed up. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, I think in part, I, I might be asking the question too early because I imagine you'll be speaking about this later in your talk, but, but the last question, uh, two questions ago made me think about um, what other classes of Hamiltonians might lead to a speed up. Um, and those other estimates that were given for the end product might give some hints. I never thought of looking into literature for those kinds of calculations. For example, the, the, the Hamiltonian might not be key local, but might have some tensor network structure or might have some tree structure. And yeah. you, know, you mentioned chemistry and molecules definitely um, mm -hmm. have more structure than just being k-local. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that will be a very interesting question to explore for future work. Um, try to um, apply some of the analysis here to understand the performance of product formulas for simulating other systems. Um, okay, so I guess maybe I'll continue. Um, I'll talk about some applications that we found in our work um, to digital quantum simulation and quantum Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so my first example is a simulation of nearest neighbor lattice system. So um, I guess in the simplest case, we have this uh, 1D nearest neighbor system. Uh, let's say we have a Hamiltonian, uh, which is decomposed as uh, n minus one terms or n terms, and we only have nearest neighbor interactions. Um, uh, this kind of systems um, are able to model many important physical systems in kinetic matter physics, in nuclear physics, and quantum field theory. And it has been studied in different contexts by previous work. So for example, there's a previous work by Jordan Lee and Presque, um studying this kind of system in the context of quantum field theory simulation. So they say, they, they claim that you can actually use product formulas to, simulating, to simulate this kind of nearest neighbor lattice Hamiltonians with a complexity that is very close to n times t. So remember, n is the size of the system and t is the evolution time. So it's basically um, a complexity very close to n times t. So um, they made this claim in the paper, but they didn't give rigorous justification. And what we can do is um, we can apply our new results to give a rigorous justification of this claim. So um, remember that um, to understand product formula, we have to compute this quantity called alpha computer. Well, um, it's given by this sum of nested commutators. Um, what we can do is uh, we can start with the innermost uh, layer of this operator. Um, we start with this H gamma one, um, for this operator, you have n minus one choices or n choices. It can be arbitrary Hamiltonian term. But after fixing one term in this Hamiltonian, and we ask uh, how many number of terms don't commute with this one? Well, there are only constant number of them because we are looking at the nearest neighbor system, uh, maybe at most two. And uh, we can have the same question for the third operator. So we say, um, how many number of terms don't commute the innermost uh, two operators? Well, there are also constant number of them. So we can apply this argument to all the operators in this expression. And uh, as long as the order of the product formula is constant, we can always have constant number of choices here. And there are only uh, n dependence for the innermost layer operator. So overall, the, um, this alpha computer um, is bounded by uh, this O of M. It has a linear scaling in terms of the system size. Okay, so now we can basically plug these results um, into the uh, main theorem of this paper and uh, we can correspondingly derive, derive this Jordan-Yen-Preskill claim about the gate complexity of 
um, simulating this nearest neighbor lattice system. Okay, so this is a simulation of nearest neighbor lattice system. My second example is a simulation of electronic structure Hamiltonian. So in this case, um, so Hamiltonian looks a little bit complicated, but at a high level, it's decomposed as the sum of a kinetic term plus two potential terms. And here I'm considering the second quantized plane wave electronic structure. So this kind of system, uh, efficient solution of the simulation problem could be helpful in the design and engineer of catalysts and materials. So people have been trying to consider the simulation of such a Hamiltonian. Well, um, let's say if you have a n-spin orbitals and you want to evolve the system for time t, then the best previous algorithm for simulating this system is an algorithm called the interaction picture algorithm developed by Low and Wave. Um, so this algorithm is asymptotically speaking very fast, but unfortunately people don't quite understand the practical performance of this algorithm. It's a very complicated algorithm. And uh, so now we can ask what happens to product formulas. Well, if we want to analyze the product formulas, remember that we have to exponentiate each term from the Hamiltonian. Well, for the potential terms written down here, that's not very difficult because uh, you know, these are the so-called number operators. They all commute with each other. So you can directly e exponentiate those terms. But for the kinetic term, there is some, some issue here because in general, uh, like this second quantized uh, operators won't commute with each other. But there's a trick that you can use here because um, although we are summing two indices, J and K here, the coefficients will only depend on the difference of K and J, right? So you have K minus J here, whereas you are summing over two indices. So basically your coefficients matrix is a translation invariant matrix. And in terms of that, it can be diagonalized by a Fourier transform. In this case, we're using the fermionic Fourier transform. So basically, if you apply this fermionic Fourier transform, you can diagonalize the kinetic term into this diagonalized form and implement using product form. Okay, so now the question is, what will be the gate complexity of this algorithm? Well, again, let's try to turn to this alpha computer. Well, by using some standard rules of second quantized operators, commutation relations, we can estimate the size of this alpha computer um, to be n to the, to the p plus one. And if you further plug this results into the main theorem and you get the gate complexity of the product from the algorithm, which is like n squared times t, very close to that, um, nearly matching the interaction picture algorithm. So in the special case of second order formula, this confirms a recent numerical study by some lots of people from Google's group and other groups. Mm, okay, so this is a second example. The third example um, we have been looking at is uh, this example of simulating K-local Hamiltonians. So in this case, you have um, Hamiltonian uh, given as the sum of operators and each operator only acts on k codes, so k is constant. So this kind of system appears in, in the study of many, many areas of physics. And the best uh, previous algorithm to simulating this kind of k-local Hamiltonian is an algorithm called a qubitization algorithm developed by Lo and Chuang. Um, so basically, um, if you apply this qubitization algorithm, you find that the gate complexity of the simulation will depend on this quantity called the one norm of the Hamiltonian. Um, I won't be able to explain why we have this dependence, but basically we have to go through all the terms in the Hamiltonian. And for that, you have a, a complexity dependence that depends on the sum of the size of those terms. So we have this one norm dependence of the Hamiltonian. Well, again, um, a question that we can ask is what happens to product formulas? Well, um, again, we have to look at this quantity called the alpha computer. Uh, it's given by the nested commutators. And uh, if you use some locality property to simplify this nested commutator, you get this expression. So this is a one norm. We have already seen that. 
but uh, we have this new quantity, uh, this three vertical line norm, um, I'll call it the induced one norm. So this induced one norm is defined as um, this quantity where you fix uh, one index, let's say L, that's the L index, and you are summing over all the remaining indices. So this is um, something we define as induced one norm. Okay, so now you plug this results into the main theorem. You try to figure out the gate complexity of product formulas, and you find that the resulting algorithm will scale according to, almost according to this induced one norm. Um, and uh, it turns out that this induced one norm is always smaller than the one norm. And sometimes this gap can be significant for some systems. So in this case, we can hope to actually use product formulas to do a faster quantum simulation. Okay, so um, my next example is a simulation of rapidly decaying power law interactions. So you have a Hamiltonian uh, given as a sum of several terms, and you assume that the size of those terms will decay according to some power law, let's say one over the distance to the power of alpha. So examples of such systems include the dipole-dipole interactions and van der Waals interactions. And um, there are also some previous studies of simulating such a system. For example, the best the previous algorithm for simulating this kind of power law Hamiltonian is an algorithm inspired by Lee Robinson bounds. So um, there are some localities that you can use to simulate this kind of system. So again, the question is, what can we say about product formulas? Well, um, since we have some locality here, like the interaction strength of this Hamiltonian decays really very fast, we can actually do something clever. So we can first do a truncation of this Hamiltonian. We throw away all the terms with very little size. And uh, it turns out that we, if we choose a cutoff to be something like this, then um, it will be very good for the parallel Hamiltonian. And for the truncated Hamiltonian, we just, again, compute this quantity alpha comma tilde. And after some careful calculation, you can see that the scaling of this alpha comma tilde will be something like O of n. So plugging this result into the main theorem of our work, uh, we can get a product from an algorithm uh, with a scaling that is something like this. So if you compare this scaling with the best of previous algorithm, you see that the factor two in the exponent is now improved to one. So it's, a, it's an improvements. Uh, you can hope to, again, use product formulas to do a faster quantum simulation. Okay, so my next example is a simulation of clustered Hamiltonians. Uh, in this case, you have an n-qubit Hamiltonian and you try to group different qubits into different parties. You have strong interactions within each party and then you have weak interactions between different parties. Um, so there's a previous um, study of such a Hamiltonian um, done by Peng, Harrell, Alzot, and Wu. So they give a hybrid classical quantum simulator uh, for simulating such a system. So in the construction of their simulator, they use product formula as a subroutine, and uh, we are able to apply our new results to improve the performance of the simulator. Okay, so my last example is a simulation of transverse field ISO model and quantum field magnets. So Actually, here's uh, not quantum simulation anymore. It's quantum Monte Carlo simulation. It's a classical simulation. Um, so the goal here is uh, you try to approximate the partition function up to some multiplicative error. So there are some previous results by Bravi and Gossett. So they consider simulating the transverse field icing model and quantum fair magnets. And their algorithm use product formulas as a subroutine. And again, we are able to apply our new results to improve the performance of the simulator. You know, although it's uh, still not a practical uh, algorithm, it's uh, absolutely um, an improvement. Okay, so we have been talking about uh, approximating the evolution of a quantum system. And if your goal is uh, not to simulate uh, the full dynamics, but you rather try to approximate the results on a local observable, then you can get a further speed up. So we show that 
you can actually use product formulas to simulate local observables with a complexity that is independent of the system size for parallel interactions. And uh, as a byproduct, we obtain a Lee-Robinson bounds nearly matching our recent bounds. Okay, so we have been talking about uh, the asymptotic scaling, but um, you, you can ask what about the constant prefactor of, of this bounds. So what we have done is we have redone some of the numerical simulations of the, the previous one-dimensional Heisenberg model. And uh, our new results are illustrated by this uh, green squares. And we find that um, this new data indeed improves over the previous best data. And uh, it also seems to be pretty tight. It only loses by a factor of five compared to with, with the empirical performance. So um, it turns out that the result of this analysis would also gives you a pretty tight error bound in practice. Okay, so um, we can make a very brief summary. Um, basically, we try to understand some of the mathematical mechanisms behind this product formula approach and try to identify some applications of this mechanism to simulating quantum systems. So specifically to the simulation of nearest neighbor lattice system, justifying the previous Jordan Lee and Pascal claim, to the simulation of electronic structure Hamiltonians, um, nearly matching the interaction picture algorithm, um, to the simulation of general k-local Hamiltonians, um, outperforming the qubitization approach, um, to the simulation of rapidly decaying parallel interactions, um, faster than the Lee Robinson based approach. Um, we have some improved results for simulating clustered Hamiltonians in quantum Monte Carlo simulations, and also some new results for simulating local observables. So it turns out that underlying all these improvements is um, some mathematical clues that we developed for analyzing Trotter error. Um, I guess I still have a few minutes, so maybe I'll very briefly, um, thanks. I'll very briefly talk about um, some of the underlying ideas. It's not too difficult to understand. So, so the first component is um, try to understand the different types of the error. So let's say we start with a product formula and we try to um, simulate this Hamiltonian for some time. Well, um, it turns out that you can have different types of the error. For example, let's say you, you can have an error that is additive to your ideal evolution. So you have this ideal evolution plus some error terms. Well, you can put the error in the exponent of the time ordered exponential. So you have this um, operator E tau, which is inside the uh, time ordered operator. Well, you can also have a multiplicative error like this. So you have this ideal evolution times this error operator. Um, it turns out that you know, these three types of Trotter error are equivalent to each other when you talk about quantum simulation. But for other applications, such as quantum Monte Carlo simulation, uh, remember that your goal is to try to approximate the partition function up to some multiplicative error. So probably in that case, you might want to use this third type of this analysis. But in any case, um, the, the, the good thing here is that all the three operators will have a very common structure. It's, um, they will always consist of unitary conjugations, something like this. So you have some operator in the middle and then you have unitary conjugations on both sides. So, Later, when we discuss representation of this Trotter error, we'll be able to analyze, discuss how we analyze the unitary conjugation of um, such an operator. Okay, so this is error typed. So the second component is order conditions. So by definition, um, the product formula will satisfy some order condition. Let's say if you have a piece order product formula, um, you approximate the ideal evolution to piece order accuracy. So you have some order condition here. Well, equivalently, um, you have some other order conditions for the additive error and the multiplicative error. So why we care about the order conditions? Well, it turns out that you can use order conditions to cancel terms. So specifically, if you have a piece order condition, you can argue with some single arguments that 
um, those low order terms in the Taylor expansion won't appear. So they're basically zero operator. Okay, so now that we have some error types and order conditions, we can try to represent the Trotter error. So remember that in the Trotter error, the common structure is um, this kind of unitary conjugation. So you have some operator in the middle and you have unitary operations on both sides. So we basically try to understand how to represent this expression. Well, it turns out that this expression has the following kind of expansion. So you have finite number of terms in the front and uh, you have some remainder terms here. Um, so terms in the front, they are time independent operators. So basically you, you can apply order conditions to cancel those terms. So they won't appear in your final representation. Well, for the remainder terms, what you can do is uh, um, you derive the following representation. So there are a lot of exponentials inside this representation, but they are not very important because their spectral norm is one. So you can just ignore them. And the important thing is a middle thing where you have a nested combinator. And that is thing that will be preserved in the final error bound, uh, which you will give you a commutator bound in general. Um, which seems to be very tight. Okay, so perhaps um, I could um, say something about possible directions for future work. Um, um, I guess um, somebody already mentioned this time-dependent Hamiltonian simulation case. Um, this problem could um, have additional applications, for example, in developing quantum control schemes, uh, describing quantum chemical reactions, and implementing adiabatic evolutions. And um, of course the problem becomes more complicated to solve and it'll be interesting to try to understand whether the analysis could be applicable. And uh, recently there have been many generalized product formulas uh, developed. For example, uh, there are constructions based on divide and conquer idea, based on randomized construction and linear combination of unitary construction. And it'll be interesting to try to understand if the performance of this generalized product formulas could be improved using this analysis. Um, we have been talking about error analysis, but of course, if we want to use them in a, on a quantum computer, we have to discuss circuit implementation. So for some concrete systems, it would be interesting to try to come up with some optimized circuit implementation, for example, in quantum chemistry. Um, we have just derived some bounds and we numerically implement that for two systems, the nearest neighbor systems and parallel systems. And uh, as the system becomes more complicated and as you choose a more complicated product formula, um, the computation of those bounds won't be very fast and uh, it'll be interesting to derive some fast numerical procedures to compute those bounds so that you can get an accurate estimation of the gate capacity. Well, um, you can consider different cost metric. So for example, um, there are some recent work on the so-called sub-circuit model. So instead of assuming constant cost for each elementary exponential, you can assume that the cost of performing each elementary exponential will depend on the duration, uh, the time duration. For example, if you want to rotate theta angle, then the cost will depend on how large you rotate uh, that term. So probably you can get some improvements by switching to this sub-circuits model and, and perhaps it's more realistic. And um, we've been talking about simulating the dynamics and if you have some further information about the initial state, let's say if you start with a, a simple low energy initial state, then hopefully you can further speed up your simulation by taking advantage of that information. Um, more practical issues such as noise, probably you could study uh, the simulation in the process of noise and um, there could be also other applications in other areas. And with that, we have you know, a happy ending of the story and thanks for listening. So we have time for questions. So um, you, can, you can ask questions in the chat or you can unmute yourselves and, and just ask directly. Okay, let me ask a question from Ronald. You don't want to unmute yourself? I can also ask it myself if you prefer. Um, I mean, that, that 
Oh, yeah, if you can, that's easier. So, oh, yes, go ahead. First of all, very nice talk, Yuan. Thanks. So my question is about the dependence on the error epsilon. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the good things in qubitization and these other methods is that this is only like a log one over epsilon dependence. Yeah. Certainly vanilla style trotter has more like one over epsilon dependence. Um, you sort of suppress that dependence on epsilon, I think. So, so could you say if there are fancier product formulas that get a logarithmic dependence on the error? Yeah, indeed. Uh, there's a recent work by um, some of the people from Microsoft group. Um, they have developed a so-called multi-product formula algorithm. Um, so it's uh, actually the LCU construction listed here. Mm -hmm. So their idea is um, to take a linear combination of product formulas and try to implement that on a quantum computer. And uh, it turns out that if you choose the linear combination to be, uh, you choose a linear combination very carefully, you can implement a product formula simulation with um, logarithmic dependence on one over epsilon. Um, and, um, but as far as I know, um, we are not able to apply our analysis to analyzing that product formula in a satisfied way. So mm -hmm. that will be an um, um, interesting question to explore. So in, practice, um, in practical applications, usually what people do is um, they usually fix um, certain accuracy in the simulation. Let's say choose accuracy to be 10 to the minus three and do the simulation. So in this case, the error dependence will only kick in as a constant prefactor. So um, whether one quantum algorithm is advantageous will depends on the constant prefactor and uh, um, yeah. Thanks. I have a, a question along a similar line um, spirit that Rana just asked. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, Yuan, this is really beautiful work and I, I like it a lot. Thanks very much. Um, especially since you, you've, you did this also with the singular value transform work. Oh, yeah. And my question is relating to that. So as Ronald has pointed out, there are still some advantages to things like qubitization, signal processing, and singular value transform, in fact. Sure. And so I'm curious, now that you have gone through all of this readjustment of the trotterization, what do you think about the uh, relative benefits of the singular value transform approach versus this approach, uh, especially given that singular value transform can take into account what you're trying to measure and not just what you're trying to simulate with the Hamiltonian? Yes, that's, um, that's a very good question. So for example, in some of the applications in quantum chemistry, um, the goal is um, not to try to simulate the evolution of the Hamiltonian, but rather try to estimate, let's say, the ground state energy. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, for example, I guess one thing that you can do is you do a phase estimation. And in this case, it turns out that um, you don't need to simulate the full dynamics. For example, you can use um, like your qubitization approach. And in this approach, you implement some functions of the Hamiltonian, like the arc cosine or arc sine. And you can do some classical post-processing on that function. And uh, you don't have to uh, apply the singular value transformation or signal processing. And that could be um, a place where the qubitization approach could be advantageous um, over other approaches. Uh, so, so if you were a, a if you were a graduate student for the next six years that you are supervising uh, because you have turned uh, okay. uh, finished, uh -huh. uh, would you would you continue working on trotterization or would you work on something more sophisticated like what Ronald and I are thinking about? Uh, <laughs> well, um. Happy to work on both directions, but um, I guess the, the point is um, um, if we want to care about the practical applications of quantum simulation, then we always have to choose um, the, the fastest quantum simulation algorithm. And um, so I guess I have a previous picture here. So here we have um, some results for simulating the one dimensional Heisenberg model and we compare the gate complexity. And for this system, there are a lot of locality properties that you can use. So it seems that product formula is the best one. Mm -hmm. But maybe for some other systems, perhaps other approaches would be the best one. Um, and uh, 
And also if you to change what you're measuring at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I guess my personal opinion is that there's like no universal way of um, identifying uh, like the best quantum simulation algorithm. It will largely depends on the system that you are simulating. Great, thank you. Thanks. Can I ask another question about this picture? Sure. Um, it was a, okay. Go, go ahead. I know Lynn has been waiting to ask a question for. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Can I? Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, so it's about this picture that's on the slide right now. So um, it seems that, that not only is the, uh, the empirical performance of the product formula sort of down, which because this is a log scale means constant mm -hmm. factor improvement, like a much better big O, but also the slope seems to be better. Is that right? Yes. So, um, so here's uh, the general form of uh, this kind of nearest neighbor in hex uh, mm -hmm. system. And uh, it turns out that the product formula, um, as we are able to show, is, um, has this kind of complexity, which mm -hmm. is very close to n times t. And if you just naively use a qubitization approach, you will have something like n squared times t, I think. Mm -hmm. So that n squared times t will be larger than this n times t if you choose appropriate product formula. Mm -hmm. So that probably explains why the slope of the product formula will be smaller than the, the other approaches. So there's an um, algorithm developed by Harold Hastings, Cotter and Lowe. They apply this Lee Robinson based approach and they can combine that approach with qubitization um, to get a nearly optimal simulation. So that can also help. Yeah. For the, that probably gives them a terrible constant in the big O or not? Uh, not necessarily terrible, but um, my personal takeaway is that the product formula is still advantageous for simulating this system. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice talk. Thanks. And uh, the first one follows the previous uh, line of questions, which is related to quantum signal processing and the quantum signal value transformation and other people. Mm -hmm that uh, you did. And uh, well, for the quantum signal uh, processing, everything, the circuit is very good. The only troublemaker is really the block encoding, right? Yeah. So um, um, do you think there are matrices that are inherently much easier to construct the block encoding, but uh, much trickier to do cauterization? Oh, this is, um, this is a very good question. So, um, well, I guess um, a very common way to construct block encoding is um, to use this uh, linear combination of unitary formalism. Um, and Which it turns out that bad. in many systems in quantum chemistry, you can get um, lower gate complexities than the product formula. So um, usually if you naively implement product formula, your complexity will at least depend on the system size of, the, of your Hamiltonian. But if you construct this, um, linear combination formalism, let's say the prepare and select circuits, it won't directly scale with the system size. It depends on, for example, if you are simulating chemistry system, it depends on the number of spin orbitals in your system. Mm -hmm. So basically you have a better scaling if you use uh, this kind of linear combination unitary approach, mm -hmm. block encoding approach. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So. So the second question is uh, related to your outlook, uh, which is said that you want a fast numerical methods for computing the error bounds. Mm -hmm. uh, can you be a little bit more specific, which is, uh, I mean, you really don't directly compute these bounds. Is, is this uh, for uh, a posteriori uh, error justification and uh, also dynamic change of the step size or something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. I guess a typical way is uh, you can do some in empirical estimation. So yeah, usually you do delta t, delta t over two. You do some other constant. I mean, yeah. some, there's an order. I mean, like the Melny device, that would be the standard thing. But uh, here it seems to be pretty keen at computing exactly these bounds. Can I know why? Uh, yes. Yeah, so as I just mentioned, a typical way is uh, you can try to compute that for small systems like. Uh, seven qubit system, eight qubits, and you can try to extrapolate the data to much larger sizes. And mm -hmm. you believe that will be the, the 
the performance of product founders. And um, but I don't know. I guess maybe in other applications where we really care about the accuracy, perhaps um, it will be interesting to try, try to derive some some rigorous error bounds and try to guarantee that indeed your your results after the simulation is um, achieving this accuracy um, in a rigorous way. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? It looks like Anurag has a question in the chat. Sorry. Oh yeah, just a follow up on what Andrew said. Uh, I'm just wondering whether this log one over epsilon dependence might be conceivable using product formulas. And by the way, you and very nice talk. Oh, thanks. Um, can you repeat your question? I mean, you mentioned right that uh, uh, to get this log one over epsilon in this mm -hmm. product formula formalism, uh, people have started using LCU methods, which Andrew mentioned that it requires ancillas. So, is it possible that you know? you might be able to achieve log one over epsilon dependence using non ancilla based methods. Yeah, um, I don't know, maybe for some special systems you can achieve, um, okay, I guess in the extreme case where all the terms commute with each other, you don't have any error. So <laughs> um, that error dependence is uh, not there, but my impression is that for general systems, you will always have that polynomial dependence on well over epsilon. And maybe there are some lower bound arguments for that, but I am not sure about that. Um, for some special systems, um, you should be able to improve that, like in the extreme case where all terms commute. Got it, thanks. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, let's all thank uh, Yuan again for the talk. Uh, thanks, Yuan. Thanks very much. So I wanted to remind everyone that next week we're having the third workshop at the Simons Zoom um, Institute. So this is a workshop on um, quantum devices organized by David Di Vicenzo, Barbara Derhal, and Ignacio Sirac. And you can find the workshop schedule by going to the Simons website and there, there'll be Zoom links there. So I encourage everyone to attend. Because of the workshop, there won't be a seminar next week. And we'll have probably the last seminar um, of the semester week after next, uh, when Lin, Lin will tell us about some of his work on uh, quantum algorithms for linear algorithms. So thanks, everyone. Um, have a good Tuesday. And let me stop the recording.